everyone and welcome back to the damage report, but not just the damage report, that's nothing. This is Earth Day, making this a very special day in the news indeed and a special day here at the TYT network. Um, we're actually mostly not gonna be talking about the environment uh, on TDR today, although we did in the pre-show. The reason being that later on today, as we have been alluding to for the last couple of weeks, after the post game of the Young Turks today, we're gonna be launching into our massive yearly Earth Day special. Um, we are preparing so much. We're gonna be talking about emissions. We're gonna be talking about environmental news from around the world in a, a big environment focused uh, meanwhile in. We're gonna be talking with um, someone from the Sunrise Movement about the, the, the path to the Green New Deal. We've got updates on Greta Thunberg and other climate activists. We got tons of stuff, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, but in advance of that, there is a lot of other news. And so we're very lucky to be joined once again on the show by the communications director for Ultraviolet and the host of There Are No Girls on the Internet, Bridget Todd returns once again. How's it going, Bridget? Good, I'm so excited to be here. I'm very excited to have you here. Um, we've got a big old packed rundown of things for us to opine on. And uh, we're gonna main, the big main story today has to do with vaccination, a couple of different angles on it. Um, we were talking before the show, Bridget, about um, what we feel comfortable with after having been vaccinated. We're gonna see what the American people think a little bit and what's going on outside of America as well. So um, thank you everybody for being here, uh, regardless of what platform you're on. Uh, we would very much appreciate not only you hitting the like button, but also if you wanna send us any comments or super chats, tweets, anything like that. Uh, Bridget and I will respond as we go if you have any questions or anything. Uh, but with that, Bridget, you ready to do this thing? Let's do it. Okay, let's jump into it. <clears throat> Joe Biden gets to and has declared a sort of victory on one of the main promises that he made at his inauguration, which was that in the first 100 days of his presidency, we would hit First, they said 100 million doses of vaccine administered, but they destroyed that in like 48 days. And then they said, okay, we're gonna go for 200 million doses administered. And they've apparently done it with a couple of days to spare. And that is even without the supply of Johnson and Johnson's vaccine, which is undergoing a safety review. Um, so that's probably a few million they weren't able to do. But the US has been shipping out more doses than are being used in recent weeks, which is, Good news in terms of logistics of vaccine delivery, bad news in that it says some bad things about the US demand for the vaccine, which we'll get into more. But uh, but let's acknowledge they have administered 199,426,628 vaccines as of April 21st yesterday, leaving eight days with the goal achieved. That's pretty good. That's Not so pretty. exciting, it's so many vaccines. It is, and it means we're a good chunk of the way towards return to normalcy, towards herd immunity. Um, there's still, you know, a lot that needs to be done since uh, each of those doses, much of it, you require two. So, you know, like um, I got Johnson and Johnson, but I believe you have one of either Moderna or Pfizer, right? Yes, I have Moderna. I am half vaccinated, so I get my mm -hmm. second one next week, and looking forward to getting violently ill, but excited to be fully vaccinated. <laughs> I have. Um, I've heard some things about that second Moderna shot. I don't envy you <laughs> experience, but it's worth it, obviously. Definitely. I think so. Uh, so here's the thing though, as we alluded to, they've been shipping more than they've actually been giving to people, which look, that could be an administrative thing. Like all of a sudden they're doing a bad job of scheduling or something like that. Um, but I don't think that's what it is. And we have a couple of pieces of evidence towards that. One is that President Biden, who has met that first goal, is now trying to go beyond that, less by sending out more vaccine and more by encouraging people to get the vaccine. And here's the way that he's doing that. He announced a new tax credit yesterday to reimburse small businesses that give workers paid time off to get vaccinated against COVID-19. The tax credit will be available to businesses with fewer than 500 employees, allowing up to $511 a day for each employee. Biden called on all companies, regardless of size, to offer paid time off and offer other incentives such as gift cards or bonuses to encourage employees to get vaccinated. That is a big old tax cut, $500 for each employee each day. Yeah, that's I, the employees aren't getting that money though. That's not no. what they normally get. <laughs> 
I mean, I think that's great. You know, I'm happy to see that. We're kind of addressing some of the realities that go into why someone might have difficulty accessing a vaccine. When I got my vaccine, I had to take off, take the day off work, you know, go to the vaccine site, kind of wait around. Not everybody can do that, and so I think this is a, a a good way to sort of address some of the actual logistical challenges that people might face in trying to get access to the vaccine. So I'm I'm really happy to see this. Yeah, no, and I'm really glad that you said that too, because um, whether purposefully or not, I'd sort of implied that this is really just an issue of vaccine hesitancy. But you're totally right. Like, if if you have to drive a good distance, if you have to potentially wait in a line, if you're working multiple jobs, it's not an automatic that you can do that. If you're like, and so sure, if, if this encourages people to give their employees time off so they can get that tax credit. And especially if they roll some of that money back into the employees in the form of bonuses or I think that sometimes gift cards can be used in a way that's sort of condescending by companies. But look, if that gets people to get vaccinated and they also save their life, then that's a good thing. So overall, I don't know, I don't know how much this is going to accomplish, but it seems like a pretty good attempt to get more people to get vaccinated. Yeah, I think so too. And I think you're right that we talk so much about hesitancy. And I think that we should be talking about that because it's a conversation that we need to have. But I also want to continue having conversations about access and making sure that folks sure. who do want to be getting vaccinated have the access to do so. And, you know, I'm kind of like you, I'm always a little bit skeptical when something is going to the business owners. I feel like I want cash in the pockets of workers, I want incentives going right to the workers. So I don't have to worry that, you know, well, is XYZ boss actually going to pass that, you know, that initiative down to the to the individual employee? I hope they are, but you know, I always think money in the pockets of workers is better. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to see this. I think it's a, I think it really yeah. does address some of the some of the access issues that folks are facing. I agree. Although it does leave some questions unresolved. So for instance, can a company claim it if they if some of their employees already got it? Would there then be gift cards for that? Would they be for you know like Barnes and Noble or Best Buy? I'm just saying I got vaccinated TYT. <laughs> Maybe look into it. There might be some money. We could split it. Anyway, um, but uh, Bridget did ask for a conversation about hesitancy, and so you know what? Let's do that. Let's have a conversation about hesitancy because uh, I want to talk about a chart that we mentioned briefly on the pre-show yesterday, and that is uh, for those who have uh, not already received the vaccine over time. Uh, when they're polled, do they feel like they're likely to? Is it a thing that's going to happen or are they not sure? So this is an interesting chart, but I understand uh, it's changing over time because the people who are answering it haven't gotten vaccinated. So those who've been vaccinated are sort of dropping out of the sample with each passing day. And you can see there that the percentage responding that they would not receive the vaccine if it was made available to them is going up fairly rapidly as a share of respondents up to almost 40% of the remaining people out there. And that is even when you consider that like they're being asked, would you opt to get it if it's available to you? It's available to them, like it's available to everybody basically. I know there are some states that are a little bit further behind, but for the most part in the US, it is available to you. And then like if you like discount the people are saying I would not receive it, the people are like, I'll get it right away. Well like TikTok, go get it. <laughs> It's available to you. Yeah. What are you waiting for? Do you not know? Maybe, maybe the information hasn't been made available, but go get it. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I mean, looking at this data, I it's concerning to see how many people who are saying I would not receive it is going up. I think that has to be a direct correlation between, you know, all the kinds of dis and misinformation we're seeing about the vaccine. And I think what we really need is to really have an honest, true accounting of some of the ways that our medical industry in this country has not always been very inclusive, has not always made people yeah. feel like you know they were included in the conversation. And I think that's a tough place. I think that's a tough thing to do. But I think you know when you look at this, look at these numbers, it's clear something has to be done. The fact that the vaccine is available for everybody, yet you have so many people expressing hesitancy. I think that clearly that conversation needs to be had. Yeah, no, I, I'm so thankful for the, the added bit of, bits of context that you've added because yes, um, access is still an issue. Some people saying I'll get it right away would probably like to, but but still can't, so that's 100% true. Um, hesitancy isn't one thing, it comes in multiple forms. There are people who have probably been incredibly skeptical, rightfully so, about the pharmaceutical and medical industry their entire lives. 
there are other people who just trust everything that Tucker Carlson tells them. Those are different things and the solutions are probably gonna look quite different. I have a little bit more respect for one than the other because at least it's historically grounded. When Tucker Carlson tells people on his show the vaccine doesn't work, yeah, that's an issue. I could see why that might be encouraging the numbers too. Hard to get through to those people though. Um, but anyway, the end result of this is that as again, we talked about in the pre-show yesterday, the US will probably run out of adults who are enthusiastic about getting vaccinated within the next two to four weeks. So you know, like when Biden was like, hey, by the 4th of July, we'll all be able to go out and get a hot dog. Well, by then, there might not be anybody that's trying to get the vaccine at that point because we will just be a country of 70% vaccinated, also kids, and 30% people who are just not gonna get it no matter what. And they will continue to get COVID and some of them will continue to die. Yeah, it's so upsetting because it doesn't really, I don't think it has to be that way. You know, and it just makes me sad because I feel that it's just another issue that we've made so, that has been made so politically charged. We're talking about public health data and keeping people safe. It breaks my heart that there are people out there that have access to this vaccine, but just won't get it because they heard Tucker Carlson say something about it, or they heard, you know, somebody who did not have their best interests at heart say something about it, and that planted a seed in their mind to make them not get yeah. it. And so it, I also had this fantasy that Biden laid out that by the summertime, like we'd be back to normal, things would be fine. But looking at this data, it's it's pretty clear that that might not be the case. Yeah, yeah I I have a fantasy, and and I will say I'm going to make it a reality. I am going to Gen Con this year, whether it happens or not. I might they might the building might not be open, there might not be anybody there, but I'm going to be outside of the building in Indianapolis this September. So America, do what you need to do for me to get my board game convention, <laughs> people. And um, thankfully, Biden is doing some of what he can do to encourage people uh, to get it. I, there's going to be like you can't you can't force people, obviously, and um, you would hope that the people who were hesitant, um, having months go by and having hundreds of millions of people get it, and uh, almost universally them doing just fine with it, would convince them to change their mind. But unfortunately, it seems to be doing the exact opposite. Some of these people are almost certainly telling themselves whether it works or not. All those other people got it, so I don't need to. And that is very much not how it works. Not how it works at all. Yeah. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. The vaccination campaign here in the US has been highly successful. And I don't mean that just in terms of getting people vaccines. It's been very profitable, we'll say, for the companies making it and for their shareholders. Because Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca, three of the world's top coronavirus vaccine manufacturers have paid out a combined $26 billion in dividends and stock buybacks to their shareholders over the past year. A sum that conveniently can be compared to the cost to fully inoculate all of Africa's entire 1.3 billion person population. That is not a random comparison, it's a pretty timely one because many countries in Africa have thus far gotten the supply of vaccine necessary to inoculate less than 1% of their population. Many have received literally no doses, not a dose, not 
like for the wealthy to get preferential access to, not for the president to get no doses. But meanwhile, some people are making a lot of money. And some people like me stupidly didn't think to invest in them earlier last year. But anyway, Bridget, that's that's quite a sum of money going out specifically. That's not like their whole profits, that's dividends and stock buybacks. It's so much money and really it's one of those things, one of those times where you can really see clearly how capitalism has kind of failed us globally that, you know, in other in like America we're doing so good at vaccinating people and then you look at other countries and they don't have nearly enough vaccines and people are getting so rich. I mean, it really does make you question like what are our priorities here as a nation, as a people? And it seems to be money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and making sure that they have continued access to that. Um, let me get throw out a number, another number here. Uh, this is a different set of companies, but um, uh, the new report, uh, and you can get all this information, by the way. A great write-up Jake Johnson did in Common Dreams. Um, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna are projecting revenues of $33.5 billion just from those vaccines. Not everything that they produce. Just from those vaccines, a massive amount of money. And uh, let's see, the report notes that one of the reasons pharma companies have been able to generate such large profits is because of intellectual property rules that restrict production to a handful of companies. So in theory, without this international agreement, you could have generic versions of these vaccines being produced around the world. That would likely have the negative side effect of uh, dropping the, the cost a little bit, how much money they're making, those profits, dividends, buy, uh, stock buybacks, all of that. I guess the silver lining though would be that uh, way more people around the world would get vaccinated. There'd be a lot less COVID and a lot less needless deaths. So I don't know, Bridget, what do you think? Pros, cons? I mean, <laughs> yeah, less people dying of COVID and more people being vaccinated sounds horrible. Like, how can you choose? <laughs> exactly. Well, horrible for their board, perhaps. Um, but anyway, people are pushing for a change to uh, the, the current way the system is set up and the intellectual property rights uh, involved in it. Uh, the Maza Sayum, the leader of the People's Vaccine Alliance's Africa campaign, called on Joe Biden specifically to, quote, put the health of all of humanity and shared economic prosperity ahead of the private profits of a few corporations by ending US opposition to the proposed intellectual property waiver. Um, which is true, and I'm, by the way, it's not even necessary, but Maza there is, is referring to shared economic prosperity. It's not even that, th the way that it's working right now, we talked about the profits for a few of these companies. And sure, it's a payday for their investors. It's not that the world economy is going to do better. I've looked into it a little bit, and it turns out that a continued pandemic all around the world's bad for trade. It's just good potentially for these companies that they can make a ton of money first, vaccinating wealthy countries and then assuming they maintain their exclusive ability to produce this, also making that much money many times over, eventually someday getting to the rest of the world. It's a payday for them, but it's bad for most other industries. It is bad and I think you really hit the nail on the head when we think about the economic impact of COVID. We should be thinking about it like that, that if, if folks are dead, you know, that's, bad, that's economically bad for everybody, right? And so, you know, let alone putting people first, we should really not be thinking about this from a perspective of how can we make these shareholders richer? How can they strategically, yeah. you know, make decisions to line their pockets? We need to do what's best for all of us. And I, it's clear to me that we're not doing that, but I hope that things change. I'm happy to see people putting pressure on Biden, asking if they can, you know, waive this intellectual property. You know, it, it, it really, I, I think particularly in a global health crisis, if there's ever gonna be a time where people are more important than money, it should be now. Exactly, yeah, and he, he could do it, he could do it. He could be a leader, he could be the bold FDR 2.0 that he wants to. He could save hundreds of thousands of lives conservatively, at least a couple hundred thousand lives. He could do that, and think about if he did that. Would those industries be angry? Yes, they'd be angry, um, but I think the like, They'd have a little bit of solace in the fact that they've apparently already earned dozens of billions of dollars. Like they're gonna do, they're gonna do pretty well. Would it hurt their stock price a little bit? Sure. And I guess that would bother them since they bought back so much of it. But the dividends already went out. Their investors have gotten some money. You could even announce it a month in advance, give them a little bit of time to prepare or something. But think about the good that would be done morally, economically, politically. 
couldn't hurt Biden to be seen as the guy who once again, like can we get to the point where we stop simply asserting that America is the best country, that we should be the leader of the world, we do the most good around the world and actually demonstrate it, show don't tell that sort of thing. Can we have that Biden? But I, I really doubt it, Bridget. I just, I don't, I don't see him as being bold enough, strong enough, courageous enough to stand against these industries. I mean, I, I hope, I hope you're wrong. I will see. You know, I think that right now, what we need is bold action. And I think, I think the last time that you, I was on this show, we talked so much about how, particularly when it comes to COVID, the United States has a lot of work to do in terms of reinstating our, our. Persona as this like world leader. I think that mm -hmm. Trump really did a lot of damage to the way that we think of ourselves and the way that we other countries see us abroad. And so I think bold, decisive action by Biden could go a long way in repairing some of that damage that we've been doing for the last four years. Yeah, yeah, I know you're you're dead right. Like, and and he wants to do some of that. Like, you know, he he reentered Paris. He but. But that's easy, that's easy and that's so automatic. There wasn't a Dem running in 2020 that wasn't gonna do that, that's easy. Will that get you some cred internationally? Sure, I'm sure that they like it. But like, think about if you were to not only release the patents, but start the US government buying and shipping vaccines around the world. And if you think that that's crazy, understand that we've already done stories, multiple countries are doing that. Yeah. China and Russia are doing that. And specifically to gain favor in these countries from their government and from their people. Imagine if Biden did that. And by the way, like we said, in like two weeks, we're gonna run out of people that really want it anyway. Like we'll have the excess supply, we could do it. Think about the goodwill, how much goodwill we would get. There's little individually that he could do that would be more beneficial in virtually every conceivable fashion than him making the vaccine available internationally to these countries that have been so callously left behind in this. This is, as everyone says, vaccine apartheid and it doesn't have to be. Absolutely, I completely agree with you, but I wanna add one point, which is that it just goes to show how, how much Republicans have this grip on our discourse. We're not even having this conversation of whether or not yeah. we should be shipping our excess vaccines overseas. Because if we did, I think half of the GOP leadership, their heads would explode. And so we're not even able to have conversations grounded in the reality of what's going on and where where need actually lies. Because we want to avoid this like big partisan political tantrum that you know they would throw. Yeah, I don't know. I, I say you're, they're gonna be throwing a tantrum. Choose the battleground that you want to have the tantrum on, because they'll right now they're just gonna make it about critical race theory or the situation of the border or, or something with Dr. Seuss. Like it's gonna be there either way. Make them freak out about the fact that you're you're giving these vaccines. I would argue that makes you look even better. The fact that Ted Cruz doesn't like it, that's a good. You you want Ted Cruz to be opposed to you, both here in the U.S. and internationally. That's how you know you're doing something right. Exactly, exactly. Now, that said, we have not done that as a country. So let's talk about the cost of that as it's playing out right now. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but last week was actually the worst ever for COVID cases around the world. Record number of cases. It might not seem like that since, hey, I'm vaccinated, we're all getting vaccinated here in the US, but. That's not how it's going internationally. And some countries in particular are doing really bad. India just broke a record 234,000 new coronavirus cases. Now, that's a narrow record because as you can see in this chart, we basically got to that too here in the US. But they're not going down now. When that chart gets updated in a day or two, it's going to be even higher. 1.6 million new coronavirus cases in just a week in India, over 1,300 deaths. And you can see, by the way, the chart of the deaths here, if we can switch to this one. You can see that India is shooting up. Now, the US had a couple of bad spikes. Brazil has been lingering at really high number of deaths, but India is going up. And the thing that's really scary about India, and we'll see this sort of play out in some of the evidence we're gonna provide. Is that it is incredibly likely that these numbers are not actually reflective of the true numbers in this country. Um, thanks to how big it is, how spread out it is, the incompetence of the Modi government in dealing with the pandemic, these numbers are horrific, but they're probably only a hint at how bad things actually are. So we'll, we'll get to that information. But Bridget, this is sort of a demonstration of what 
is likely to continue in India and other countries if the US doesn't help by providing vaccines. Absolutely, it is heartbreaking. And I think you know it goes really back to what you were saying earlier. America, we call ourselves the greatest country in the world. We talk about how we're this global leader. This is a global pandemic. And so if we truly are a global leader, this is a time for us to demonstrate that by actually mm-hmm. leading. And you know, this is like, you're, the pandemic doesn't care about these borders, right? Like it is a global issue. And I, I wanna see the United States act as a global leader that we purport to be so often. Exactly, yeah, and we can, we have that opportunity. So let's get into the evidence now that it might actually be worse than it looks. So as we said, almost 1.6 million cases in just a week, bringing total cases to more than 15 million in just that country. In the space of just 12 days, the COVID positivity rate doubled to 17%, while in Delhi it hit 30%. Hospitals across the country have filled to capacity, but this time it's predominantly the young taking up the beds. In Delhi, 65% of cases are under 40 years old. Because remember, you don't have to be elderly to get this. You might have heard some propaganda from the Trump administration or the right or Scott Atlas or something, but no, young people can and are getting it. So here's the thing about your positivity rate shooting up to 17% or 30% in a city like Delhi. It is changing so rapidly that unless you have an amazing testing capacity, it's almost certainly not reflective of how much COVID is actually out there. They are testing who they can, but they're short on lots of supplies as we'll get to. And so it's likely that it's even worse in some of these cities. I mean, 30%, that's like that's like New York during the spikes. That's like the worst hit US cities. And we're seeing it now in places where their hospitals do not necessarily have the supplies to actually save the people who are getting sick. That was the sort of saving graces that we had in the US. We eventually got the ventilators, we had experimental treatments and things like that. But that's probably not going to be the case in a lot of these areas. At least that's what the early evidence is, seems to be indicating, Bridget. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it might it might not be. It seems like it might not be the case in some of these places. And yeah, I just I keep going back to this. I think that we need to help where we can. We are no longer in a place where you know it's like New York City, the worst numbers. You know, open the newspaper mm-hmm. and it's you know deaths on deaths on deaths. And I think that. It is really up to us to make sure that other countries have what they need, whether it's the vaccine, whether it's supplies. I do believe that this is a real opportunity for us to act as a global leader. And I, you know, when I, I hear agree. about how bad things are in India and Brazil and other places, that's all I think is, you know, we should be helping where we can. Yeah, yeah, and as we always stress, um, if if none of what we've said about why this should happen was convincing to you, just understand that uh, right now in India they are getting decimated by uh, traditional COVID and COVID variants, and in a population that large with COVID running rampant through so many areas, they are almost certainly going to give rise to other variants on COVID. And if we're lucky, fingers crossed, the vaccines that we have will continue to protect against them. But if you wanted to create a COVID that could break through our vaccine shield, I can't think of a better way to do it than to allow a place like India to just run rampant with COVID. So if none of the other things convinced you pragmatically, economically, well, how about this? Like just in terms of protecting yourself, in terms of public health, it seems like a good idea to deal with this. Now, um, I wanna give a little bit more information about what's going on there. Um, The president of the Public Health Foundation of India said that leadership across the country did not adequately convey this was a pandemic where it had not gone away. Victory was declared prematurely and that ebullient mood was communicated across the country, especially by politicians who wanted to get the economy going and wanted to get back to campaigning. And that gave the virus the chance to rise again. I feel like that's our entire experience in the latter half of 2020 here in the US. Uh, That's what they were doing there too. Now, let's get scary. At least 24 COVID-19 patients in Western India died on Wednesday when the oxygen supply to their ventilators ran out amid a nationwide shortage of the gas and a surge in infections. They're just running out of oxygen in hospitals. It's gotten so bad that some people tried to loot an oxygen tanker, forcing authorities to beef up security. Because after all, if you can take it, it's worth a lot of money in a country that desperately needs it and doesn't have it. In addition, gas and firewood furnaces at a crematorium in the Western Indian state of Gujarat have been running so long without a break during the pandemic that metal parts have begun to melt. And with hospitals full and oxygen and medicines in short supply in an already creaky health system, several big cities are reporting far larger numbers of cremations and burials under coronavirus protocols than the official death tolls, according to crematorium and cemetery workers. And we have one quote 
from um, one, Prashant Kabrawala, a manager at a crematorium. He said, I have been regularly going to the crematorium since 1987 and been involved in its day to day functioning since 2005. But I haven't seen so many dead bodies coming for cremation in all these years, even during an outbreak of the bubonic plague in 1994 and floods in 2006. So all of this points to the numbers look really bad, but the numbers aren't actually reflective of how bad it is. And God only knows, maybe we'll never know. Maybe in six months there'll be a study that shows that 5,000 people, 10,000 people were dying every day. I don't know, but I do know that if we don't help, it is likely to continue, and that is a tragedy that cannot be allowed. Oh, absolutely not. And just reading, just hearing you read that quote kind of broke my heart because, in, in addition to all of the unnecessary deaths and suffering, just the emotional and mental weight and impact of dealing with this this scope of crisis, where you're dealing with this level of death and despair every single day, like we've never seen before. I mean, I it just really it, it's heartbreaking. And I think it, yeah. if if reading quotes like that doesn't motivate people to say like, my God, we need to act. I don't know what will. Exactly, you're 100 percent right. We know that the investigation of Matt Gates started not under the Biden DOJ, but under William Barr, Trump's man, one of his most loyal soldiers. But he hasn't had much to say about Matt Gates, his legal troubles or anything like that. Very little information about his involvement has actually come out. But we have something that is at least tangentially related to that. And it comes about in a sort of circuitous route, but stick with me. The US Attorney for the Northern District of Florida, Larry Keefe, who was nominated by former President Donald Trump, apparently looked to open a wide ranging probe into voter fraud in Florida just before Joe Biden was sworn in as president. The public integrity section at the DOJ's headquarters thought that the scope of the proposed investigation was too broad, you know, because basically everything having to do with voter fraud in those times was. But anyway, that prompted Keefe to turn to Matt Gates, who in turn took Keefe's concerns to Trump, because remember, they're like peanut butter and chocolate. They they go well together. Gates said that Trump then told White House counsel Pat Cipollini, who was in the room, to tell Attorney General William Barr that Trump believed Keith's legal theory had merit. When Barr learned about Gates' conversation with the president, he was incensed. The Attorney General called the US Attorney and gave him an earful, according to two people familiar with the call. Quote, if I ever hear of you talking to Gates or any other congressman again about business before the department, I'm going to effing fire your ass, Barr told him. And the exact timing of that phone call wasn't clear, but it did take place in the late summer, early fall, as the department was also investigating whether Gates has had sex with a minor and broken federal sex trafficking laws. So, Bridget, we don't know for sure if it being Gates that was communicated to bothered Barr, or if this is a general thing where he doesn't like information being given to given to congressmen. But that was a time where. Barr must have been aware of the investigation. So it is possible that that plays into this. That's what I'm thinking too, because for me, I mean, to be clear, I don't know. But for me, it's mm -hmm. not one of the only things that makes sense. Why would Barr, Barr loves scheming, the idea of scheming to steal elections. Why would he not want to talk to Gates, who also loves stealing, uh, scheming to steal elections? I have mm -hmm. to assume that he must have known what was going on with this investigation. Yeah. I, maybe he was mad that he wasn't directly roped in, because yeah, like Barr would be totally down for it. Trump definitely would be down for whatever broad investigation of fake voter fraud you want. He would definitely be down. I don't know if maybe Barr was feeling a bit pushed to the side. We were sort of getting that impression last year, um, but it's also possible that Barr is one of those people who, like a lot of people around the country, absolutely despises Matt Gates because he's the worst. And didn't want someone leaking information about what Barr might have viewed as a legitimate investigation into Matt Gates's crimes. This is deep in the realm of speculation, but at this point we kind of have to speculate because while there had been sort of a flood of leaks about the investigation early on, they've been very quiet about it. Matt Gates isn't really saying anything. Donald Trump is staying quiet. Barr definitely isn't saying anything. And while we wait for the results of whatever investigation is ongoing to come out. I'm curious, I don't know, and this is what we have to go on right now. Yeah, I'm definitely curious, but I think the one thing that this report makes very clear to me is how early on they were interested in planting this seed of the big lie and thinking yeah. through the machinations of how they were going to you know, cast public doubt on the election results, which we know, as you said, like election fraud, 
widespread election fraud just not a thing in this election or in other elections. And so for me, that was one of my big takeaways as well. They were really planting this seed quite early. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they they knew that that was something that they should probably invest in. Um, since Trump did such a terrible job of campaigning and terrible job of managing the pandemic. They could have avoided a lot of trouble involved with voter fraud by just doing a good job of governing, but eh, it sounds difficult. Anyway, uh, let's move on to weirder news, if not lighter. <clears throat> Tucker Carlson's got sort of a new bit and that bit is a bit of insanity. He's been kind of losing it on his program and this happened again last night. Take a look at this. He represents the state of California, he's incredibly smart. He went to Stanford and Georgetown. So when Ted Lou speaks, you're really seeing the Democratic Party's brain trust on display. And with that in mind, we wanted to bring you one of his recent pronouncements. This is a tweet, and it's in response to one of his colleagues, the Congressman Scott Perry. Now, Perry was making an argument we have often made because it's true. And that is that Democrats are using mass immigration to transform the country to change who votes so they can control who wins. Ted Lieu was very annoyed that Scott Perry said this. And so he sent the following tweet and he was clearly enraged as he did. Quote, dear Scott Perry, native born Americans like you are no more American and no less American than an immigrant like me. Good point, we agree with that. And then he said this, and with every passing year, there will be more people who look like me in the United States, you can't stop it. So take your racist replacement theory and shove it. In other words, you're being replaced and there's nothing you can do about it. So shut up. <laughs> Luckily with people like Ted Lieu in charge, they're not gonna get a lot done. Guys are a moron. Okay, the, the bit at the end was also very weird. That delivery was weird. But that laugh, like imagine if you were on an elevator with someone and they laughed like that. I would be like hitting buttons. I don't care if I had to crawl out. That was bizarre. Yeah, it's like a demented Joker cackle. I feel like he's about, <laughs> like this is his like, like villain origin story where he beca he becomes the ultimate form of himself, like a, <laughs> like a super villain, right? Like that cackle, that is not like, that is terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. And and the thing is, like, I don't know if there was something about you, personality, or a weird lack of emotional intelligence that you would occasionally, with no appropriate context, just let out a witchy cackle like that. Wouldn't you do it like more? Like he just started doing it two days ago, then he did it yesterday. So we're sort of forced to compare it to what we know of him normally, which is. His like base emotional state is that's it, like no emotion, let alone some bizarre like burst of emotion like that. I don't know what explains it. I know Ted Lou has a theory. He just says that's a maniacal laugh. Like it's <laughs> pretty insane. That tweet by Ted Lou, which we can bring up, um, probably will result in Tucker Carlson losing it again once once again. But I don't know if it's like Tucker Carlson having to do the, the performative racist stuff every night, maybe the Republicans being out of power, maybe it's just getting to him. I don't know, but that's that was that was not a good look. That and the last look. Yeah, I I don't like it. Now, uh Ted Lou had a perfectly fine point, which is um immigrants are not only as American, but generally because of the insane standards we have for the tests that you have to take to get citizenship and all that, often know more about America than native born Americans. Um they're Americans and them being here, them working here, them marrying here, them voting here is not some replacement. It literally isn't replacement because generally as a rule, when an immigrant comes in, we don't boot some Italian guy over the border. That's not how it works. It's at worst extra people, not replacing people. But Tucker Carlson, who by the way, last week or two weeks ago has said multiple times, I'm not actually spreading replacement theory. And Fox defended him after pushing replacement theory saying it's not replacement theory. He sure seems to get sensitive when you say that it's replacement theory. Why is he so defensive if he's not about that? 
Yeah, for someone who says that he is not trying to spread replacement theory, um, it's interesting that white nationalist sites like Vidare were so excited that he was talking about this. They said things like, "Oh, one of the best things that Fox News has ever, has ever aired," and they praised it by mm -hmm. saying that it was like full of their talking points, like their white nationalist talking points. And so, if it's if if Tucker Carlson is not actually trying to spread white replacement theory, uh, people who are really into white replacement theory. Sure, like what he has to say. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, and you know what? You're not, you can't always be held super responsible for who likes your stuff in theory. But when you keep doubling down on the thing that brings in white supremacist viewers, we get to judge you. That's what we do. Yeah, like they say, when someone tells you who they are, listen. And he's been telling his audience who he is, and that's why the audience is there. Anyway, let's move on to just about the worst, worst sort of news. Um, this is a rough one, so hold on to your butts. Okay. <clears throat> I'd said uh, within the last week that the GOP basically had two things they were interested in over the past few months. That is stopping people from voting and attacking the trans community. Uh, I guess they took that challenge because now they've got a third and I'm kind of wishing they would just go back to those others or maybe go to sleep for a while. Tennessee's GOP controlled Senate passed a bill yesterday that would require medical providers to bury or cremate fetal remains after abortions, sending the legislation to the governor's desk. And I have not been able to get a read yet on whether it's likely to be signed, but this is America, so why not? Sure, that is what the government should be doing, forcing women who've been through an abortion to deal with their medical providers or, and we'll get into some of the details here. According to the bill, certain medical providers must dispose of fetal remains from surgical abortions by cremation or burial, like a, like an actual burial. Like, you know, like burials you've seen. No matter when this happened, no matter how early in the pregnancy, because that doesn't matter. This isn't about anything medical or scientific, this is about being as cruel as possible to women, increasing the net amount of suffering that women have to experience if they exercise their constitutional rights. We'll, we'll give more details, but Bridget, what, what do you think about this? I think it's horrible. I think it's some of the most disgusting, horrible legislation that you could ever imagine. And I think it's we need to be clear that this kind of legislation, it hurts poor women, it hurts women of color, it hurts black women. It is, it only hurts people who are, it, disproportionately hurts people who are already marginalized. And so I want to be clear about that. But I completely agree with you. This is about controlling women, controlling our body and putting barriers for us accessing our constitutionally protected right to an abortion. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I also think it's really important to note that this is not isolated to one state. As you said, we've seen this kind of legislation coming all over the country. And so I think that this really yeah. is something that we should all be paying attention to because it's really horrible. Exactly. No, you're you're 100 right. Um, there's been, let's see, Indiana was the first back in 2016. And since then, at least 10 other states have had similar requirements, though legal challenges persist. But look, the Indiana law was upheld by the US Supreme Court back in 2019. And why not? It has a conservative majority. Remember, like in 2016, when we were saying that elections have consequences and the Supreme Court matters? It does in a lot of different ways. It bears rotten fruit like allowing this law to continue. And and think about how needlessly cruel it is, not just adding an extra layer to what you have to go through, extra costs as well. And they've continually tried to make exercising your reproductive rights as expensive and difficult as possible. But burial and cremation, like sure, they're very common as ways to dispose of remains here. But they're also wrapped up in culture and religion. Not everyone in America follows the same traditions for things like death and how that's supposed to be managed. But no, you will have to because you'll be shocked to find out that virtually every Republican pushing for this in Tennessee does agree on religion. They are Christians. And as was pointed out in our document, Governor Lee, who's very anti-abortion, driven by a particular sort of repressive, regressive Christianity, which is almost always vigorously opposed to women living, experiencing life. And so they found a way to really combine all of their interests into one horrendous piece of legislation that if it ever gets overturned, it could take literally decades to remake the Supreme Court into something that would turn the, that would get rid of this thing. Yeah, I saw one of the Republican lawmakers who was in support of this legislation saying, you know, oh, well, 
you know, when someone gets an abortion, they remain, they, they just go into the medical waste. Isn't that horrible? I'm curious if these kinds of people, are they up in arms about other kinds of medical waste? Or is it just when a woman gets an abortion? Like, like this kind of idea that they're so concerned with um, you know, what happens to these remains. I think it's so disingenuous. And I also think it's just needlessly cruel. If you're a woman who's, who's had to unfortunately bury a child, this is something that they're legislating this kind of cruelty and forcing women to, to do this in order to just get access to abortion. I think it's really, it's, it's cruel. There's not another, I can't think of another word to describe it. It's hurtful and it's cruel. Yeah, it's hurtful and it's cruel and it's purposefully cruel. I mean, that is, that's the Republican Party. It is weaponizing cruelty to get what they want. You know, whether it's tearing families apart at the border, needlessly making things more difficult for women who are undergoing something that probably for them is gonna be one of the hardest things they've dealt with. Uh, that's what they do. And a lot of their voters very much like it. Breaking news this morning, the House, which was said that it was going to vote on DC statehood, has apparently voted in support of DC statehood. That is what my team is telling me. Um, for the Democrats in the House to do so is, I don't know, Bridget, is it surprising? It feels like I'm always ready to be disappointed, but what do you think? So I don't, so I'm so happy this has happened. I live in DC, I was born here. If I, if I could turn my camera around, I won't because my apartment's very messy, but I have a DC flag <laughs> hanging from on my wall. Uh, so I'm very excited with this. This was expected, at least in my perspective, I think. The real hurdle will be in the Senate, but I want to say like we have never been closer to DC statehood ever in my lifetime. For me, this is one of the biggest racial justice and civil justice issues of our time that we are closer than ever to actually making a difference on it. And so I am so hopeful that DC will be the 51st state in my lifetime. I got to warn y'all if it actually does happen while I'm living in DC, the bender that I will go on to celebrate <laughs> will be <laughs> like <laughs> epic. <laughs> But I, I genuinely do think, you know, it is high time that the citizens of DC, we have been disenfranchised for so long. And I think, you know, it is high time that we have the kind of representation that the rest of the country gets. It's it's immoral, it's racist, it's so terrible that we have not gotten it. But I am so optimistic. I loved seeing this news today. And I, I think we are closer than we ever have been to DC statehood. I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, close. I, we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, Biden says he's in support of it. I have this pit in my stomach thinking about some particular senators um, that we've been focusing a lot on the show recently, actually, who are gonna almost certainly stand against it. Uh, the right is already complaining. I can't imagine the collective meltdown that they would have if you know Americans got representation. Like, they don't want people voting in areas where they can technically vote. They certainly don't want them voting in areas where they can't yet. Um, and the argument we've responded to a couple times, but I'd like to hear your thoughts is, uh, the Dems just want to do it because they know the DC is going to vote for them. What do, you, what do you make of that that argument as a reason not to do DC statehood? I mean, it makes no, it's, it's completely stupid. It makes no sense. People, the citizens of DC deserve voting representation. It's immortal that we don't have it. If the Republicans are really this concerned about which way we're going to vote, maybe they should try having better policies, policies that make people actually want to vote for them if that's what they're so concerned about. Mm hmm. I think mm -hmm. so. You're implying that politicians could try to appeal to people. Yeah, That's I mean, it's radical. not. <laughs> it's it's an idea. It's just so pathetic. This <laughs> surrender, like, there's no way we've got nothing. I look out at you, DC, and I know there's nothing I could say or do, or that my donors would let me say or do that would ever appeal to you. So I will block you from being represented. It's such a pathetic surrender, it's but so that's what they've got. Some of the things they say about DC, you know, oh, DC doesn't have a car dealership. Never mind the fact that we do, you know, DC, you know, <laughs> there aren't there aren't loggers that work in DC. People who live in DC aren't real Americans. It's funny because when I pay my taxes, they certainly cash my real check and take my real mm -hmm. money out of my real bank accounts. So it's really funny how we become not real Americans when we're talking about whether or not DC residents deserve statehood. I had not heard the logger thing. I had heard the car the car dealership thing. Yeah, and you had um, Representative May saying it's too small, even though multiple states are smaller. There was some other Republican chucklehead who was like, uh, "No, they don't deserve to be a state because they they're they're filled with criminals." And I thought, well, you can make the problem a little bit better by retiring, get out of D.C., and it'll be <laughs> one person closer to paradise. But anyway, yeah, yeah, we'd never let a place with crime. 
Look at Florida, it's not even that they just have a net a lot of criminals. They have the weirdest, kookiest criminals, they still get to vote. Anyway, it's BS, but I'm glad in particular that it happened on a day when you're with us to give your impression. Me too, yeah. so excited. Okay, so let's jump into our last topic. We have just a couple of minutes, let's do this. <clears throat> James Carville is going to defend AOC from a common attack that we've been hearing over the past few months. But in his defense of her is quite a bit of attack. So let's hear what he has to say. There's one part of the story that just irritates me to no end. And that is, well, James, okay, we got Marjorie Taylor Greene, but you got AOC, stop. AOC is a talented, smart person who I think has some impractical, borderline naive ideas like giving everybody health insurance, all right? She's a very talented person. Marjorie Taylor Greene is, is, is like literally out of her mind. So look, it's not that I don't disagree with some of what he said. Marjorie Greene is out of her mind. And personally, I hate the comparisons, these sort of shallow both sides -ing, Politics should never be analyzed more than a millimeter deep uh, comparison between the two because they're both young and got elected recently. Um, but yeah, there, he, his portrayal of her, a little bit biased, I feel like, in terms of his uh, evaluation of her politics. Yeah, first of all, talk about a backhanded compliment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? like, I think I, AOC just got negged. Yes, it's like <laughs> negging, it really is. Um, I also think it's really wild to call, you know, giving everybody healthcare naive. You know, ask some other countries that have managed to do it whether yeah. or not it's naive. I mean, I don't know what world he lives in where that is the wildest thing that someone could possibly <laughs> ever consider. Um, but I agree with you. I think comparing these two women, I think it's kind of sexist. I think you know, two. I think you're exactly right. These two women who are who recently got elected, having having to pit them against each other as if it's some sort of you know cage match or something I think is really short sighted and just we deserve we deserve a better political discourse. We deserve a discourse that doesn't pit women against each other like this. And honestly, the comparison between Marjorie Taylor Greene and AOC, that's just insulting in and of itself. AOC does actual governing. She stands for mm -hmm. things, she gets things done for people. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene just stunts and scams. So I, I, I resent the the you know comparison just on its face. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I'm not gonna say that Marjorie doesn't do any work. You know, those weird pull ups she was doing seemed kind of difficult, I guess. Um, but no, AOC, like, does anyone doubt that she works as hard or harder than everyone else in Congress? Like, you know, I don't always agree with everything that she does, although generally I do, but she clearly is there for the substance. And when she's not working on legislation, and she's already put forward more substantive, wide ranging legislation than lots of people have been in Congress for literally decades, she's doing more work for her constituents back back in her home district than virtually everyone else too, while also trying to be a leader in political communication around the sort of moral urgency around a lot of these topics for the entire US population. Doing all of those things simultaneously, Marjorie Greene occasionally puts masks on with offensive comments. That's really it. And the issue is that the media largely I think is to blame for the comparisons, but Marjorie Greene is also to blame. She is. Desperately hounding AOC and following her, literally following her around, trying right now to have a debate about the Green New Deal. Um, and so, like to some extent, I, I do blame her. She is trying to make them comparable. Um, I'm sure she thinks that AOC is substantive -less, and she thinks, well, she knows herself, so she thinks, you know, roughly comparable. But yeah, I wish that we could get past that. Yeah, I think you're. I think we do need to put a lot of blame on Marjorie Taylor Greene. And honestly, it really is so sad and pathetic to see someone have to use someone like AOC's coattails to get relevancy. You know, it must be really hard to always have to do that kind of thing. Always be talking about AOC and threatening her and like challenging her to debates and this and that. That's got to be a really sad existence, and I really don't envy having to cling for relevancy in the way that Marjorie Taylor Greene seems to have to do. 100% couldn't agree more. Um, but unfortunately, we are over. Bridget, so great getting to talk to, uh, politics with you once again. Um, where can people listen to more of your work? Well, you can check out my podcast on the iHeartRadio network called There Are No Girls on the Internet, where we're diving into all things conspiracy theories, internet, geeky, all the fun stuff, tech, you name it, we talk about it. You can follow me on Twitter at Bridget Marie or on Instagram at Bridget Marie in DC.
Awesome. I don't know how in depth you go into like daily tech news updates. Do you have any thoughts about that recent um, Apple show, those new iMacs or anything like that? Oh, uh, I, I I almost hate to say it. I am such I'm so fangirl excited about any kind of Apple news. <laughs> I want to hate on it so bad, but I'm just so deeply like, I'll check it out, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. The colors of those new iMacs are really gaudy. I don't know. But anyway, um, okay, next time you're on, we're talking a bit tech. I'm Love excited it. for that. Uh, but until then, yeah, everyone go um, follow Bridget uh, at her show. And Bridget, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. The battle in the United States government to get the Equal Rights Amendment has lasted longer than the lives of some of the people who are currently fighting for it. And we're about to launch into one of the most sort of technical legal opinion battlefields for that fight. Hoping to learn a lot from our guest who joins us now, the Senior Counsel for Free Speech for People, Courtney Hostetler. Welcome to the Damage Report. Thank you for having me. Uh, glad to have you here. Um, with your organization recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, being involved with a group of organizations that have been calling for the change to a legal opinion that is potentially holding up the ERA. Could you tell us what that's all about? Absolutely. Back in 2019, back in 2020, when Virginia became the 38th state to ratify the ERA, thus pushing us over that important three fourths mark, the National Archivist, who is the person who is in charge of actually taking the text and declaring that it is part of our Constitution turned to the Department of Justice under then Attorney General William Barr and asked its opinion on whether or not he could certify the ERA. And the question was whether the time limit that had been placed in a resolution that had been attached to the ERA way back when it was first introduced, whether that time limit, since it has passed, um, barred these states from essentially ratifying it, right? And it mm. becoming, you know, passing that 34th mark. The DOJ decided to wade in and give its opinion. And we think this was a problem for two reasons. One is that the Constitution actually has no role for the executive branch in the passage of amendments to the Constitution. There are basically two players. There's Congress. And then there are the states and the executive branch really isn't supposed to be there. So our opinion is that the DOJ really shouldn't have entered that conversation at all. But the other major problem, of course, is that the opinion that the Department of Justice came out with was just wrong. And the reason is because it, it basically is saying that this resolution that was passed along with the amendment by the by Congress back in 1972 is sacrosanct and that the states mm -hmm. are bound by it. And they made this decision because some amendments back in the early 20th century actually included time limits in the text of the amendment. So if you go read the Constitution now and say, uh, look at the 18th amendment or the 22nd amendment, you'll actually see that the text of the amendment includes a passage that says this must be passed by three quarters of the states within seven years or it's inoperable. So it's in it's in the text itself. So when it went to the states for ratification, the states were ratifying text that said this is an inoperable if you don't pass it within seven years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes so in this case. Exactly. In this case, they did put the Congress put a time limit in a resolution sort of next to the amendment for lack of a better word, right? So mm -hmm. in Congress's opinion, they wanted it passed in three years. But the text that went to the states, the so Congress passed the amendment. There's no time limit in the text of the amendment itself. And the text of the amendment that went to the states did not contain a time limit. And as we, we've actually seen not one, but three states have since the time limit passed, have ratified it. And I think mm -hmm. that speaks to the ongoing need for the ERA and the fact that we are seeing an, an ongoing demand for equality and a recognition that the protections in place now aren't enough, that we really do need the ERA. 
We've tried to make do with this patchwork, but the ERA is is necessary and important. And we've seen, like I said, three states have in the past decade or so recognize that what we have now is insufficient. We need that we need that push to the ERA. They've ratified the text that they ratified says nothing about a time limit. It's not it's not like the 18th Amendment. There is no there's no limit in the text itself. So states should not be bound by it. So what we have now are we have 38 state, we have a Congress that has done their job. They've passed the ERA, right? Way back in 1972. And we now have 38 states that have done their job. 30, 38 states, three quarters of the states have said, this needs to be in the Constitution. We have ratified it. At this point, really, the National Archivist's only job is to certify that ratification by the states. Mm-hmm. And it's part of the Constitution. And in fact, the National Archivist wrote a letter in response to an inquiry from Congresswoman Maloney, I think back in 2012, saying this essentially. And it was really only when the National Archivist received this opinion from the Department of Justice early last year that they stepped back and said, sure. in deference to the DOJ, okay. we're, we're, gonna, well, we're not gonna certify. Yeah, absolutely. So um, since then, obviously, we've got a different head of the DOJ. Just out of curiosity, because I honestly don't know, it so rarely matters. Is the archivist the same person that it was when that uh, decision from the DOJ changed the course of the ERA, or has it been changed with the the coming in of the the Biden administration? No, the archivist uh, has actually been in his position since 2009. So it's the same archivist. And so um, what exactly are your group's uh, asking for? Is it for a new legal opinion being put out by the DOJ? Is it for the archivist to ignore the previous legal opinion? Is it for Biden to get involved or Congress? What exactly would you like to see happen? Our ask is for this opinion to be rescinded. Because as I mentioned, not only is the opinion wrong, the DOJ is part of the executive branch. And our constitution doesn't create a role for the executive branch to play in the passage of amendments, right? There's Congress, there's the states, and then there's this, the National Archivist whose job is purely ministerial, right? His job is to say, this has been ratified by 38 states, it is now part of the Constitution. He is deferring to this DOJ opinion. What we're asking for is for the DOJ to rescind the opinion. It's it's wrong, It's it's a it's a wrong opinion and we want that rescinded, and once it's rescinded, it clears a path for the National Archivist to acknowledge that the steps laid out for the passage of an, the ratification of an, an amendment have now been met. Congress mm-hmm. states it should be certified, and okay. we don't think that this opinion should stand in the way anymore. Exactly, or or in theory, be replaced with a different opinion, which. Doing that would just play into the idea, the in your opinion, I guess, the false idea that the the executive branch should be involved in the first place. Exactly. Um, and so, our viewers, is there anything that they can do um, to to get involved in this if they want to see the ERA get passed, that they could help out and potentially get in the DOJ to take this uh, this position? Absolutely. I, the and I think this is probably recommendations you've heard before, but contact your representatives. Contact your representatives in Congress, in Senate. Ask them to put pressure on the DOJ, ask them to raise their voices in support of the ERA and make sure their opinions are known that way. There are some great organizations that are doing work in support of the ERA. I recommend your viewers check them out. A lot of them have grassroots movements and do do work to mobilize. So there's a few ways that they can get their voice heard and reach out to other activists and amplify from there. Okay, can I, uh, this is moving a bit to the side of, I'm curious about your opinion. So uh, as you pointed out, originally passed 50 years ago, it's been a very long time, obviously. And the the amendment seems like such obvious common sense that it it's sort of fundamentally offensive that it's taken this long to even get close to it potentially being passed. But I'm curious, you know, like I, I watched um, Miss America when it, when it came out in the last year, and you saw the radicalization of people against the ERA and how that played out with the right wing and all of that. Were it to be reintroduced fresh in 2021, 
Do you think enough Republican senators or would would actually support it? Do you think that like if it was to be redone that enough states would potentially ratify it? What what, you, what is your opinion about that? The concern with starting again, this is Oh, well, I'm not advocating for that by the way. I'm just curious as a thought experiment. <laughs> I think there it's still going to be a battle. And unfortunately, as we know, discrimination on the basis of sex is and the reason we need this is the reason why it might be a battle. Unfortunately, there are people out there who want to continue to discriminate against people on the basis of sex. And that's why we need the amendment. So I think there is there would be a fight. I think there are it's a the good thing is there it is a bipartisan issue. There have been a number of people and a number of of representatives, a number of if you if you look at um, general uh, they've they've asked questions of the general population and something like ninety three percent of people support this amendment. So it really wow. is a bipartisan uh, issue. It's something that many people hold near and dear to their hearts and have been fighting for um, across these party lines for decades at this point. So I don't think it would be in you know a, a quick and easy process. But I I would like to have faith that there are enough people who would be able to recognize the need for it and move to make it happen. The problem is really why why should we do that when we have a ratified totally. amendment, right? We we've, we've done it. It's happened. Um, and and as a maybe point of interest, it's it wouldn't be the oldest <laughs> amendment to to be ratified. The not even by close. The previous amendment to get ratified, the twenty seventh, was two hundred and two years in the making. Wow. And yeah, it's and it's a really interesting one. It's the basic idea is, if Congress votes to give themselves a raise, it shouldn't kick in until after their. They've gone through an election period, basically, until you might be out of office again. The idea is, mm-hmm. you know, no corruption. Don't try to immediately benefit yourself. Took 200 years, but in 1992, the final state recognized, yeah, we really need this. Yeah. And so sometimes we really see that issues that were present even 200 years ago don't just resolve because of other means. And we're seeing that with the ERA. It is, it was necessary in Alice Paul's time. It was necessary in 1972. It's necessary now. And one one final question, sort of just looking ahead. In theory, let's say that you're successful. The DOJ rescinds its opinion. The archivist says this is part of the Constitution. Um, I, you know, thanks to the the change of the Supreme Court over the last four years, uh, my assumption with any positive change in American society or legislation is that the Supreme Court will attempt to overturn it. In this case, though, once it's declared to be part of the Constitution. Is there and there's no route for the Supreme Court to challenge that? I mean, they interpret the Constitution. They don't determine that something can't be a part of it. Is that is that a fear? Or is that outside of the bounds of a concern for ERA advocates? It's certainly something that advocates are prepared for, and it is actually a question that has come up before the Supreme Court before. And I mentioned this case really briefly. About a century ago, there was a challenge to the the prohibition amendment, actually, and it was essentially that question. There was a time, but and it was on the same question of a time limit, right? But there, the mm-hmm. time limit, as we discussed, was in the amendment itself, and that's when the Supreme Court said, "Well, it's in the amendment; it's part of the amendment. That is that's acceptable." It was a little bit of a different question because what the uh, what the defendant uh, accused bootlegger in that case was saying is, well, maybe it wouldn't have passed so fast if the time <laughs> limit wasn't in it. So, you know, does that make everything unconstitutional? And the Supreme Court said no. <laughs> but uh, so the the Supreme Court may well weigh in on it. But I think the initial step is let's confirm that the steps have been met. Congress passed. So of 33 quarters of the states. Awesome. Well, um, as we alluded to earlier, this is a fight that if uh, you're passionate about this, you can get involved in. Um, and I hope that you do. Uh, Courtney, really appreciate you uh, both engaging in this fight and also joining us to break it down here on the Damage Report. And thank you for so much for covering this and thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.